before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. The Italian Renaissance is often thought about as one of the most celebrated time periods in Western culture. As we've been taught, the Western world was coming out of the Dark Ages into a new age of creativity and enlightenment. But during this time of this newfound age of Renaissance, all also was a world of corruption, lust, and greed. And there is one particular family that I personally think is the most sensational family to ever walk through our pages of human history. But before we get into it, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a very, very, very big thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without you guys and without the support of our sponsors, this work would not be possible. If you would like to either tip the channel or join the Patreon or producer community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and after four years of doing deep dives on YouTube, we're finally here. We're about to talk about my favorite family in all of history, the Borgias. Now, again, this episode has been a long time coming because I know in past episodes, I have frequently referenced one of the Borgia family members in relationship to whatever the story is we were covering in another episode. And so I'm so excited to finally be here and be at this moment where we can talk about this sensational family. I also want to welcome a lot of our new subscribers. I've gotten a lot of messages from people who had my channel just recommended to them and I'm so glad that you're here and I'm so glad that you're you're joining us here on this journey. I this channel really I, I love doing deep dives as as my friends who have been here for a while know I am very very nosy and I am very very petty and in my opinion history ain't nothing but gossip. That's all history is. In fact, I don't understand why people don't like history. It's literally gossip. You are literally academically gossiping about these scandalous people who have been in our world like we come from these people and holy crap is it not entertaining if, if you don't find history entertaining then you're kind of missing the point because these stories that were told that are passed down to us happened to human beings just like us yes the world was different culturally back then but human beings were all the same right we all we all experience fear we all experience love we all experience happiness we all experience these same emotions and so when we can look at these scandalous stories and put ourselves in the shoes of these people it makes these stories that much more interesting and something that we can learn from and and the borgias you guys doing this deep dive, I, I probably could have shot an episode on the Borgias without even researching them because I am totally obsessed with this family and have been since I was in high school. But I, I researched anyway, just to make sure I got some dates right and all that kind of stuff. But the thing I learned doing this research is that do you guys know, I didn't know this. And when I was in high school and thinking about going to university, history was a subject I was considering majoring in because I just loved it so much. But I didn't know. Did you guys know this? I didn't know 
that there are some historians out there whose whole career is dedicated to the study of particular families. There are literal historians out there that spend their whole career studying the Borgias. I think I missed my calling. Knowing the scandals that the Borgias have been accused of being a part of and knowing that there are people out there that get to study these scandals on a daily basis and talk about them, gossip about them, be petty about these scandals. Y'all, I missed my calling. I missed it. I mean, what a soap opera. So my relationship with the Borgias, obviously the Borgia family, for those who aren't familiar, most of you probably are familiar with the name Borgias because they were one of the most powerful and scandalous, again, families. That's saying a lot <laughs> during the Italian Renaissance because there were a lot of, that's saying a lot because there were a lot of scandalous families at this time, but they kind of, they, they, they kind of rose to the top of scandal. And, and what's so interesting about the Borgias at this time, in my opinion anyway, is it wasn't just one member of the Borgia family that kind of gave the Borgias this reputation. In fact, it was multiple members of the Borgia family and three generations that gave the Borgias the reputation that they have today. When I was in high school and we studied the Italian re Renaissance, that was the first time that I was ever introduced to the Borgia family. And of course, when I was in high school, a lot of the scandals that the Borgias are famous for was not talked about in my high school history class because frankly it probably wasn't appropriate to talk about some of these scandals with some teenagers but I was so fascinated by Lucrezia Borgia that I actually remember going to my high school library and you guys who are young watching this I'm a zennial I was born in 1983, so I'm a Xennial. So that means I'm on the cusp between Generation X and Millennial. So when I was in high school, the internet was really not a thing yet. I mean, it was a thing, but it wasn't like really being used. We still use things like the Dewey Decimal System to do research papers. So I went down, I, I couldn't, basically what I'm trying to say is I couldn't just Google Lucrezia Borgia like I can now or like you can now. I, I went down to my high school library and I checked out books on her because I was so fascinated fascinated by this this girl because she was so young when she got caught up in all these scandals and I think for me as a young girl around the same age as Lucrezia 500 years after Lucrezia 500 years separate us I felt that almost empathy and compassion for the the woman that she turned into due to the circumstances of her life. But what we're going to do today, because I, I, I debated, I could either have done like a five hour presentation where we went through every single member of the Borgia family who was famous, or I decided to break it down into parts. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start by talking about the patriarch of the Borgia family. And there's actually... It's kind of like two patriarchs of the Borgia family, which we're going to get into just to kind of set the scene. Now, with that being said, when we get into Pope Alexander VI reign, Rodrigo Borgia's reign in the papacy, we're going to kind of talk about specific dates when certain things happened. But there are specific events that happened that I'm not, I'm going to give you the date and tell you what happened kind of, but I'm not going to go into great detail. Because as I just said earlier, one of the most fascinating things about the Borgias is each and every single individual that was wrapped up in this family is so interesting on their own that I decided instead of doing a really, really long deep dive, again, I'm going to do separate parts for each family member who is wrapped up in these legends. In fact, when we talk about the House of Borgia and we include every single member from the original patriarch, which is Alfonso Borgia to Rodrigo Borgia to his children, Cesare, Giovanni, who was known as Juan, Lucrezia, all these different members of the family, their story together is so crazy that historians refer to them as the black legend. Which I'm telling you, if your family is no notoriously known historically as the Black Legend, 
you got some crazy karma in your, in your life, you know? And again, that's why I think we're so attracted to this family. We were also looking, I've said this before in our, in our other deep dives, we've looked at like the Romanovs or the Valois or any of the English monarchy. You guys know I've said this all the time. I would, if I had to go back in time and live during these time periods, just let me be a peasant. Like the peasants just seemed like they had a much better existence, even though they were fighting for food to survive every day. These politically powerful families, the monarchies, the, the, the Pope, the papacy, the amount of deceit and betrayal and the dog eat dog lifestyle that they were all a part of is, is so freaking, I, I don't know if I could have survived that. And so when we go back and tell these stories, I just consider that like these children, Cesare, Juan, Lucrezia, the, the Borgia children, the third generation, were born into a very wicked world. And they really had to survive. And, and again, we'll get more into their stories as we do a deep dive into them as individuals. But before we even get into the patriarchs of the Borgia lineage. I want to kind of go back, and we, we spoke a little bit about this with Pope Innocent VIII. I started last week in the deep dive talking about the Pope before Borgia, just to kind of give us a background as to like what was going on in Rome at that time, in Italy at that time, and especially in the papacy at that time. If you missed that episode, I'll put it down in the description box below so you can go back and watch it after this if you want. But just to kind of recap, Italy at this point, so the little peninsula that looks like the boot that we know in our modern world as Italy, this is a political entity, a country of Italy, just like Germany, France, Spain, the United States where I live, Canada, Australia, these are political entities on their own. And I think sometimes as what happens when we look back at history, sometimes we look back at history through the lens of our own perspective of the world that we live in now, not really realizing that, duh, it's not going to be the same, the same thing then as it was now. So Italy, the territory known as Italy, was actually divided up into these little kingdoms or these um, principalities, if you will. We spoke about the Kingdom of Naples last week with that horrific ruler. You guys go back and watch that episode in his Black Museum. But there was also Florence where the Medici's come from. There was also Milan, Venice. So these were almost like little like in principalities or duchies on their own. It, it, it ran almost the territory of Italy, the country we know as Italy now, then ran more as like a republic. And in the middle of all this, on this little peninsula where all of these little kingdoms are kind of scurrying around for power, in the nucleus of this is the Vatican. And not only is the Vatican in the nucleus of all of these like bickering territories of Italy, but it is literally, the, the, the Vatican that is, and the Pope specifically, is literally the kingiest of kings. The Pope trumps all of the kings of, of Europe, right? He's the head of the, of the pyramid, if you will. And so there's a lot of, of chaos at this time. There's a lot of friction at this time. One thing we, another thing we also see arising with this renaissance is the fact that there's almost been like a transfer of power. And what I mean by this is during the Dark Ages, a lot of times or what we refer to as the Dark Ages, throughout history, the wealth and power of a noble family kind of came through how much lands that they owned or how many serfs or slaves that they owned. Now we're looking at the rise of money being power. And this again, we look in Florence, as, as I just mentioned, we have the Medici family. We've talked about Catherine de Medici, who was married to the French king. She was the last queen of the House of Valois. She was super scandalous. That, that chick was pretty scandalous. I'll put her video down in the description box if you missed it. She, this is a banking family. So what we're seeing again at this, this time of renaissance is this new idea of power that is not just held in a family name or in land owned, territory owned, but by the power of the bank. Yes, the Medici family did have some popes 
in their family line and they did marry some of their their um children into royal royalty just like they did with Catherine but for the most part the Medici family was powerful because they were able to give loans and they were able to fund and back certain people and certain families and certain territories so we know that the person that controls the pocketbooks really controls everything i mean we know that hardcore in our world today so Again, this new modern idea of, of money being power on its own is kind of new because before this, all we've had is really just royalty, right? And, and, and the, the um, nobility owning lands. But now we've got actual banking families. So that just kind of sets the scene for what's happening in this peninsula of, of Italy on top of Europe as a whole, because as you know, the Borgia family is very much a, a European story. So we also have, as I spoke about last week too, um, with this rise of the Renaissance, we've also got a lot of um, kind of gang gangster stuff going on, especially in Rome. We talked about this last week where I've been to Rome myself. Rome is a beautiful metropolitan city now. It's really, really fun. But back in this time, Rome, especially where the Vatican is, was not, it was like a backwaters town. You know, you had all the wheelers and dealers of the papacy living in Rome. You had a lot of monarchies coming to the Vatican to have their meetings with, with, with the Pope, the kingiest of kings, all that kind of stuff. But you also had the peasantry and there were just, it was lawlessness. It was absolutely lawlessness because the Vatican at this point and still, in my opinion, really had nothing to do with God. God's kind of an afterthought. It's kind of just for show. This is a secular political power grab with the papacy. And so this type of secularism with the political strength of the papacy is what causes a lot of this gangster crap that's going on in Rome, especially between the cardinals and their families. Another thing I want to address before we get into the story. Now, we, if, you, if you're familiar with the Borgias, you know that uh, Rodrigo Borgia became Pope Alexander VI and his children, at least three to four of his children, be also became very um, historically scandalous too. Mm -hmm. What? Oh my God, popes aren't supposed to have kids, right? Well, I want to kind of also talk about this perspective of this time period where, again, we can probably make the mistake of looking at the papacy through the eyes of us living in modern times. Now, again, as I've said before, I am not super, super familiar. You know, I have to really look at the, the way that the corporation of the catholic church is 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 conducted like how their business is conducted because I, I grew up protestant i grew up presbyterian i'm you know don't don't go to church now but the catholicism is something that's that is in essence quite foreign to me anyway and in the presbyterian church pastors can pre they, they can get married you know that there's no stopping them but we know that clergymen from from the catholic church are not supposed to get married now the big story behind this this the propaganda behind this is because it is believed that jesus was not married now we know that's not true we know jesus was married uh, yeah, obviously the missing books very much talk about this um he was married to magdalene that's i think most people know that by now and back then in the renaissance these popes also knew that that was not hidden knowledge that 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 Jesus was married. So the reason why, originally why they said that the popes or the cardinals could not be married had to do, again, with inheritance, with power, right? So again, the propaganda is today, they can't, they got to be like this Jesus guy who they said was never married, but of course that, that's a lie because he was married. But back then it was understood that because the Catholic Church was so powerful and so wealthy if the pope had been married with legal heirs it would destroy the power nucleus of the vatican this is super important especially talking about the borgias and the borgias weren't the only one that did scandalous things because of this inheritance law there were other uh, basically what i'm saying is 
Rodrigo Borgia was not the only pope to have children, illegitimate children. They all had illegitimate children. All right, so that wasn't the scandal. The scandal came with how much power Rodrigo Borgia gave his children, especially his favorite children, whom he openly acknowledged as his kids. So again, I hope that makes sense. This whole idea of purity culture, like I was born, again, born in 1983, so I grew up in the 80s and the 90s, and we had this whole like basically BS purity culture, especially for girls. That's a new thing. That That really historically has not really existed this idea of purity culture you know even look at monarchies we, we've talked about this before with um the monarchies around europe especially where the king would be politically matched with a princess from another um dynasty and the king could himself have mistresses if he wanted to the queen could not and the only reason why the queen could not have her own lovers on the side is because any children that the queen had they had to know for sure that it was the king's child because of bloodline laws, right? So so it wasn't like the queen had to stay pure because of any religious nonsense. It was literally had to do with inheritance, just kind of like kind of like the way it's going on at the Pope, which they don't get married so that legally the children can't inherit the vast wealth from the Vatican itself. I hope that makes sense. So I want you to remember that as we're telling the story. There was no such thing as purity culture back then. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry on the street knew that these cardinals and these popes had children. They were ve very well aware of who their children were. They were very well aware of who their mistresses were. The only reason why, again, they couldn't marry their mistresses had to do with inheritance. Nonetheless, a lot of these popes would give their children titles would give them job positions since they were not able to hand down their position in, in the papacy they would make they would ensure that their children had a foundation elsewhere so the, the boys especially their sons would be given like very important land grants and so the children of the pope were never secrets. Again, they were not some dirty secret hidden in a back room. They were very, they were treated themselves like princes and princesses, basically, like royalty themselves. The daughters, which we're going to see with Lucrezia, were used by the Pope or the Cardinals or daughters of Cardinal as pawns, just like the monarchy used their daughters as pawns to marry their daughters into certain principalities, into certain families in order for the Pope or the Cardinal to gain support from these different principalities again it's a political chess game nothing has really changed right we still see this political ch chess game going on in our world alliances allegiances all that kind of stuff and so i wanted to kind of set the stage again before we get into the borgia family i hope that makes sense the borgias start off historically in a very chaotic time in our history a very exciting time in our history but nonetheless again a very chaotic time so the House of Borgia is what we would call today a Spanish house, even though back then Spain did not technically exist. Um, they, the Borgia, Borgia family comes from Aragon, the kingdom of Aragon. In the 14th century, in 1378, a man named Alfonso de Borgia was born to a middle class family in Valencia. Alfonso was highly intelligent and he found himself studying in school to he studied like basically law like what we what we would call law today and as we spoke about last week again the political arena if you're studying law at this point especially in the 14th century the political arena the church and state especially in the western world the church and state are not separate things so when you're going to study civil law you also end up studying canon law. And so this guy, Alfonso de Borgia in Valencia, Spain, super, super smart kid, goes in, he's from this middle class family, goes and studies law, and he ends up getting a position within the church. Because of his intelligence, he pretty quickly rises in ranks in the local diocese of the Catholic Church. Because of his deep knowledge of politics, he was appointed secretary to King Alfonso V of Aragon. 
Now, interestingly enough, Alfonso is the grandfather of Ferdinand II, who's going to come back into play with Rodrigo Borgia. This was the guy for the Americans out there that allegedly funded Christopher Columbus to go on his expedition, which ended up allegedly finding the continent of America where I live. Now I say allegedly, if you're new to this channel, there's an alternative history that we talk about a lot with like Tartaria. I kind of cover both the mainstream narrative as well as this alternative stuff that we are now coming across in our world. So allegedly for the sake of this story, that's King Ferdinand II. And of course he marries Queen Isabel. We're going to get to them later on, but Alfonso V of Aragon and Alfonso Borgia end up becoming very much politically aligned because he starts to work with the King of Aragon. Last week with Pope Innocent VIII, we spoke about the Kingdom of Naples. As I said earlier, it was being ruled by a Spanish family. And of course, these territories, as I said last week, for a long time, there has been political strife over who's going to take over what principalities. And because of Spain's control of Naples, Rome is in the Kingdom of Naples, Alfonso finds himself in Italy because of the work that he was doing with the king of Aragon. Now, again, Alfonso is working in the church. In 1444, Alfonso is made a cardinal. For those like myself who are not Catholic, cardinals are like the second in command to the pope. They're the people that decide who the next pope's going to be. So this is the patriarch who opens the door for the Borgias to walk into the Vatican. Now, at this point, the Borgia last name was spelled B-O-R-J-I-A, I I believe. Now it is spelled B-O-R-G-I-A, which is the more of the Italian way of spelling. And the reason why Alfonso changed the name of his family name was to be able to blend in more with the Italians because as there was friction, right? There was lot of temperament in in this area of different principalities and so i can get that like for the dude's safety he's like i'm just gonna change my name i don't need any more shenanigans going on in my life i don't want to i don't know when spain's gonna piss people off so i just want to like change my name quickly now alfonso had a sister named isabel isabel had two sons one of her sons was named pedro luis And the other son was named Rodrigo. Now, it was customary in the Vatican for the cardinals, since the cardinals were not allowed to have legitimate sons. They had illegitimate sons. A lot of times what cardinals would do is they would try to bring their nephews into the fold because it, again, was protection. We talked about seminary last week with the buying and the selling of seats and and all these different, again, these different fractions and different principalities are, are behind different cardinals. And so if you can have family in your corner, blood is thicker than water, right? Like if you can have your nephews in your corner, not only is your person yourself going to be safer, but you probably are going to get a lot more done as to what you want done if you've got people who are backing you. So as when Alfonso gets to Italy, to Rome, his nephews join him. Now, this is his sister's sons. So Rodrigo and Pedro actually changed their last name to Borgia, which is their mother's maiden name, and they spell it the way Alfonso changed. They spell it the Italian way, which again, I-, I absolutely get this right. I get, I get that power of like, okay, my mom's family is actually making something of themselves, and in order for me to to really enjoy the benefits of of being of that bloodline, and for people to know that's who I am. I'm going to have to take my mother's maiden name once I get into Rome. I mean, many of you know that my name, Bryce, is actually my mother's maiden name. And the Bryce family, my mother's family, very famous family in South Carolina. They're do- they've are they been doctors since like the beginning of time. Um, they, they The Williams Bryce Stadium at the University of South Carolina. So my name, Bryce, is is kind of my, my mother, my parents gave me that name. In, in in homage to my mom's family. And when I am in South Carolina, a lot of people, when they hear my name, kind of assume 
that I'm part of the, that I come from the Bryce family because it is common in the South to give your kid your maiden name. And so, so that is kind of the same thing. If that, if that makes sense, I have a cousin, another cousin who has our grandmother's maiden name as her first name. So, so that's, you know, it's, it's, um, you get that, right? Like if, if your mom, you know, you, you kind of, we kind of get lost in our father's family because we take our father's name traditionally. But if, if your mother's family is more political pool, of course, you're going to make sure that people know you're a Borgia. Now, by the time Rodrigo and Pedro got to Rome, Rodrigo especially kind of developed the reputation of being a wild child. He was very, very young. And of course, his uncle is now a cardinal. And so he has the liberty and the power to kind of be a, a little shit, if, if, excuse me for saying that, but just very, very, very scandalous. We're starting to see these scandals already. He loved women. He loved going to the particular houses. I have to watch what I say here, but he loved going to the particular houses where ladies of the night did, did their thing, you know? So we just, he kind of had this reputation. And again, I think a lot of these kids probably had reputations because they were able to go about the city of Rome and kind of do whatever they wanted to do because no one wants to p piss off the cardinals and, and the church because again the church ain't about god it's just a political power that's all it is but nonetheless on april 8th of 1455 something kind of all life altering happens to the borgia family and that's because uncle alfonso becomes the pope he becomes pope calixtus the third now i'm just going to refer to him now as uncle pope just to make it sound better because some of these pope names it gets, it gets really confusing when like popes change their name or kings change their name it's you know we're going to see that with rodrigo he's going to change his name to alexander but now we have an uncle pope so your uncle who brought you to rome is now the most powerful person in the western world now as soon as uncle pope becomes pope he decides to immediately make Rodrigo and Pedro Cardinals. He does this again for his own protection so that he has family members around him, younger family members to protect him because of these warring factions. Now, Uncle Pope was quite elderly when he took took the papacy, so he, he's not going to be Pope for long. But because of his decision to grant his nephews the cardinal, the position of cardinal, Uncle Pope is basically the person that pushed the dominoes over for, for this family. Because what we know about Uncle Pope, about Alfonso, the Uncle Pope, is that he, he actually was a pretty good dude. It seems like he didn't really have the scandals that his nephew and his nephew's children would go on to have. Like, he definitely, you know, he there's really nothing i mean he seemed like he was a pretty honest guy he just kind of played the game the way most of them did he, he didn't seem to get into much trouble so but he is the person that definitely pushed that first domino over to set rodrigo up for the debauchery that's to come with the next generation now it turns out that rodrigo a lot like his uncle pope is highly intelligent pedro it seems is more militant like he's more of the athlete that's going to go fight fight for these these italian wars but Rodrigo is super smart. Like, he's politically savvy. And, you know, my mother used to say this to us all the time. I mean, education was really important in my family. It has been for many generations. But my mother used to say, I would almost rather you have street smarts than academic smarts. Because street start smarts are going to get you a lot further in life than academic smarts are going to get you. And the thing about Rodrigo Borgia is he seemed to have both. He seemed to have the ability to obtain information with papal law, but he was also smart enough and cunning enough to manipulate that law when it served him best. He was 25 when he became cardinal, very, very young, but he already had experienced positions of power before, positions given to him by his uncle, which we're going to get into in a second, but he learned how to use everything to his advantage. Again, very cunning, very, very intelligent, and very narcissistic, very obsessed with his own bid for power. Again, he was very much a womanizer, very greedy, but nonetheless, at 25 years old, he is really, we're really starting to see this now this new patriarch of the Borgia family 
amp everything up. But let's go back and talk about Rodrigo Borgia from the beginning. Rodrigo Borgia was born on January 1 of 1431 in Valencia, Spain. He got his first job at 14 years old in 1445, working for the Cathedral of Valencia. At 14 years old, he got his job working for the Cathedral of Valencia because uncle, who is just a cardinal at this point, pulled some strings. So you have a 14-year-old boy calling the shot at Valencia's cathedral. We're going to see this same type of behavior repeated with Rodrigo's own, own children, where he's going to end up giving his own children very powerful positions when they are literally still children. So, you know, and at this point, I have to think maybe... 14 wasn't as young back then it is it as it seems now i mean most 14 year old boys in atlanta are working are, are bad boys at the grocery store right they don't even have their driver's license yet so you know but i still know from other historical records that this is still a very young age but nonetheless in 1448 that is when rodrigo and pedro officially moved to rome once they were moved to rome his uncle made sure that the boys and his uncle at this point again is still a cardinal but he made sure his nephews were basically like given um an annual income for like existing his uncle was able to maneuver some way of paying his nephews without them actually doing specific jobs for a while like like his nephew like rodrigo is still being paid for working at the cathedral of valencia when now he's living in italy Again, this is all just giving this young boy way too much power, way too much liberty at a very, very young age. But what his uncle was also able to provide Rodrigo was further education. He was able to give Rodrigo better tutors to understand even deeply, more deeper understand canon law and civil law, especially since in this time, this is one and the same. In 1457, Two years after Alfonso became Uncle Pope, he granted Rodrigo the position of the Vice Chancellor of the Holy Roman Church. This gave Rodrigo, as well as the Borgia dynasty, way more money and way more power. Once Uncle Pope died in 1458, Borgia threw his support into another man who became Pope Pius II. He basically bribed Pope Pius II, which is not uncommon. That's how it just works at the Vatican. He told Pope Pius II that he would throw in his support for his papacy if the Pope promised to allow Rodrigo Borgia to keep his title of the Vice Chancellor of the Holy Roman Church. Now, spoiler alert here, Rodrigo ends up keeping this position for 35 years until he himself becomes the Pope. That's how cunning and conniving this guy is. In 1464, we got a new Pope. People don't live that long in this time period. So now we got a new Pope. And this Pope is actually like besties with Rodrigo. And this Pope, of course, is Pope Paul II. No problem there. They're like besties. So no bribery needed. Of course, you're going to support your bestie being the Pope because that's beneficial to you too, right? In 1471, we have Sixtus IV that becomes Pope. And Sixtus promotes Borgia to the position of Cardinal Bishop. Not really sure what the difference is between a cardinal and a cardinal bishop. Maybe it's a more specific role. Maybe it's like one step closer to the papacy. I'm not 100% sure. If you're Catholic, let me know. I tried to read up on all these things, but the corporation of the Catholic Church is very complicated. So now he's the cardinal bishop. 1472, Sixtus sends Borgia back to Aragon. He's going to run this little errand for the Pope. Because I told you we were going to get back to King Ferdinand II of Aragon because we've got this issue going on in what we call Spain, which is the issue of Castile and the issue of Aragon. These are two kingdoms, two principalities on the Iberian Peninsula. And we have this weird situation that's going on where the King of Aragon wants to negotiate a marriage with the future queen of Castile, Isabella. Now, 
the Pope is the kingiest of kings. He is calling all the shots. So the Pope sends Borgia in his place to go and discuss the details of this marriage. And it's up to Borgia. He is the one, Rodrigo Borgia is the one that gets to decide whether to give dispensation to Isabella and Ferdinand. He's the one that decides whether that marriage is going to be legitimized or not. This is a huge decision. This is huge. This, in my opinion, this is one of the biggest historical dominoes effect, the facts that Rodrigo Borgia ever did. And I don't know why people don't talk about this as much, I guess because the debauchery of his papacy is way more interesting. But the fact that he was the one that said, yes, I think it's a good idea for these two to get married, changed the course of history. Not only did it unite Spain, but it also gave females, a, we have two rulers now who are jointly powerful. These are also the people that, again, allegedly funded Christopher Columbus to go explore this way to the West. These are also the people who gave birth to a daughter named Catherine, who became Henry VIII's, the most notorious of one of the most notorious of all the English rulers, first wife, Catherine of Aragon, who then played a pivotal role in England divorcing itself from the papacy when Henry Henry VIII was he decided that he wasn't didn't want to be with Catherine anymore and wanted to marry Anne Boleyn so you guys see how like I'm like why are people talking about the fact that Rodrigo Borgia because he gave permission dispensation for this to happen is the reason why so much of history is the way it is if he had said no not allowed they can't get married who knows where we would be in history right now in fact, he became so close to Ferdinand and Isabella that their first son, Borgia, became his godfather. In fact, I don't know if I said this in the beginning. If I didn't, I apologize. I meant to. Did you guys know? Did you guys know? Another, another interesting trivia here. Rodrigo Borgia was the influence for the movies The Godfather. Did y'all know that? And the more we learn about the Borgias, you're going to see why, how gangster they were. Like they were probably like the first mafia that ever lived. Now, it is said that the Borgia line itself, even though with the birth of Uncle Pope in the 14th century to the Borgia family, they were a middle class family. But there is belief that the Borgia family actually does come from the royal dynasty of Aragon. So if that is true, then that means that Rodrigo and Ferdinand were like distant cousins anyway. But nonetheless, there is an established relationship with two with one of the most powerful monarchies at this time, which again was Ferdinand and Isabella. When he comes back from this, in my opinion, really important historical event that happened, he meets a woman. This is a woman named Venosa de Catherine. And this woman ends up becoming Rodrigo's chief mistress. So we have the first big domino with Rodrigo, like basically setting the stage for historical events to happen as they did with the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella. And then he comes back and he meets this woman who ends up becoming his chief mistress and the mother to his favorite children. Now, with that being said, Rodrigo had tons of kids. He had tons of them. He planted his seed all over Europe. But the children he had with this mistress are the ones that would go on to continue to make this one of the most scandalous families. But before we get into that, I would like to take a brief moment to thank our sponsor, Spooky2. I'm gonna play a little bit of an advertisement for Spooky2. We know that it works really great with human beings, but it also works really well for your animals. So hold tight for a moment, just for this brief commercial from Spooky2, if you would like, to purchase a Spooky 2 Rife machine, you can get 5% off of your purchase by entering my name, Bryce Watson, in checkout. All of that will be down in the description box below. So just hold tight quickly, and we're going to get back to the story. Welcome to the Ricky's Undead. I'm here with my dog, Bourbon. 
and he wanted to share a little bit about his story so that we can help other pet parents know that there are other holistic and alternative methods out there to helping your dog on their road to recovery and healing. So a little bit about Bourbon's story. We had him, um, he was running, let's say, and it was a, a rainy day and he went to run up the steps and he skipped a step and landed spread eagle and left out a huge yelp. Um, so thankfully my son carried him down the steps for me, got him in the car and we took him right to the vet. So they confirmed that he did in fact severely tear, um, basically completely both of his ACLs or what's called a CCL in dog lingo. And they said that he needed surgery to heal and recover. However, he was only eight months old at the time and they would not do surgery on him because his growth platelets were still open in his legs. So they sent me home with an injured dog and said, bring him back when he's a year old and they would do the surgery. Now the surgery, mind you, was gonna cost $5,000 per leg and two months recovery in a crate while he was recovering. And the surgery had to be done one leg at a time. So that would be $10,000 and four months of him being in a crate. That doesn't sound like a good solution to me. So I encourage you to go to Spooky2 and download their software just to kind of look around and see if maybe your ailments are in the database because I bet you they are. So now let's get into it. So the first thing I did with Bourbon is I took the connectors and I hooked him up to the TENS pads. So what I did is I took the TENS pads and I placed them on the inside of his thigh by where his knee is. So right around where the actual ACL or CCL would be located. And then I ran what we call a biofeedback scan. The biofeedback scan in the database, what it does is it sends electromagnetic frequencies into your electromagnetic field within your body. Anything that is not supposed to be there, it calls a hit. So it records up to 10 hits per biofeedback scan. It takes about five or six minutes and boom, you have your, your results. So then, once I record and save those hits, I turn around and I switch it to contact mode, keeping the TENS pads in the exact same spot that I just ran the biofeedback scan, and then I run a 30-minute contact session for him. Now, he feels so amazing when he's getting these frequencies that if I'm in messing with the Rife Therapy machine and getting something ready maybe for myself or a client, he will actually come over and be like, hey, thinking he's going to get a session. That's how much he loves it because he knows it's making him feel better. Okay, so Rodrigo meets this woman. She becomes his headmistress and she has four of his favorite children. The one this was Cesare Borgia, who was born in 1475. Giovanni Borgia, also known as Juan, who was born in 1476. Lucrezia Borgia, who was born in 1480. Giofredo, who was born in 1481. Now, once his children are born and once they start to become of age, we're going to talk a little bit about the overall feeling in Rome at this time regarding Borgia and his children, even before he became the Pope, what was going on. Because like I said in the beginning, this was normal. It was not uncommon for a Pope to have children. It was not uncommon for a Pope or a Cardinal to acknowledge his children as his children. It just was not allowed, it was not legally allowed for them to marry the mother of the children, legitimizing the children, because the corporation didn't want to have to pay off the children in inheritance. So with that being said, the culture at this time very much was used to these family ties within the Vatican, okay? 
the children were used just like pre uh, prince and princesses are used. They were used as pawns. They were given titles, not just for the Borgias, for all of the Pope's in the history's kids. Again, they were given titles. They were given land. The daughters were used as a, mar a marital alliance with different kingdoms. We're going to see that more with Lucrezia. But the Borgias took it a bit too far. It was excessive with the Borgias. The Borgia children became like the spoiled brats of Rome. A lot of times, if there was a particular cardinal that a certain country wanted to be Pope, wanted to put, the, they would often ask in part of the bribery or the seminary, what was in it for their kids. So if you, if you're like the King of France and there is a Cardinal that you want to make Pope because you think this Cardinal being Pope would give you a better alliance, then you might go to that Cardinal and be like, I will back you and I will make your children I will give them titles in the French government. I will give them land in the French government. If you promise when I back you, you'll support me. Does that make sense? So the children are super, super important. Having children for cardinals is super important for the political safety of that cardinal and for people to pull pull politics in whatever way they want to pull politics in whatever way they want to pull politics. Well, again, Rodrigo Borgia really used this to his exam to his he used this to his benefit and people started to become literally afraid of the Borgias again as I mentioned this was the inspiration for the Godfather that I just learned in my research which doesn't surprise me people started to disappear around the Borgias, just like the Clintons today. People disappear around the Clintons. Same thing with the Borgias. They had this reputation of being totally gangster. So you, to keep yourself safe, wanted to make sure that Rodrigo's favorite children were taken care of. They had full reign of the Vatican. They could come and go as they please. They could do whatever they wanted. It was getting out of hand. At this point, with all the scandals surrounding the Borgia family, this is where we start to hear certain rumors. Because people were terrified of the Borgias, because people didn't really want the Borgias around because they were so scary, they started to create these rumors that they were actually Moors. They weren't really, um, white people or Christendom. They were with the Ottoman Empire. They were really Jewish. There were all these different, again, this propaganda around them because people were terrified of them. We also started to hear um, speculation. I don't know if I can say this word on YouTube. It starts with an I and it ends with a cest between siblings. There was rumors that especially Cesare and Lucrezia, his sister, brother and sister, had a relationship. We'll say there were rumors that Lucrezia also had a relationship with her father. You guys know what I mean? We'll get more into that, though, into those scandals when we cover them individually. And that's what's interesting. Again, we'll talk about this more in more depth when we look at them individually. Is Obviously, none of us were there. This was 500 years ago. And I go back and forth in my head versus what I know of this family and the rumors are, did this really happen? Like, were they doing these things or were these just rumors because people didn't like them? People made up stuff. It's hearsay. I don't know. I guess we'll never really know. But nonetheless, we're going to talk about all those scandals when we look at the individuals. By 1483, Borgia is now the wealthiest cardinal. He is the most powerful and he is the wealthiest of all the cardinals. He's now got all his children who are young at this point. They're little, but they're still running around like brats. So <laughs> this is just a shit show waiting to happen. But thank God it happened because we get to talk about it. We get to gossip about how juicy this story is. This brings us to the papal conclave of 1492. And again, there's no God in this. It's all business. Because of Borgia's wealth, his power, and his ability to scare the crap out of people, Rodrigo Borgia was able to secure the most powerful seat in the land. He became Pope, just like his uncle Pope before him. He is now the kingiest of kings, and he took the name Alexander VI. 1492, he makes one 
a cardinal. 1493, he marries off his 12-year-old daughter to a principality of, of Italy to gain more power and support. Again, we'll get into that deeper when we cover Lucrezia. And soon after that, another cardinal accuses, openly accuses Borgia of paying off people, of bribing his weight his way to the papal seat using seminary, as we spoke about last week. This cardinal then goes to King Charles VIII of France and tries to get King Charles VIII to take Borgia off of the papacy because he's committed this crime of bribing his way on to the throne of the Pope. Now, again, this is not uncommon. This was not Alexander VI. Rodrigo Borgia, he was not the first pope to do this. Most of the popes have done it this way. Most of the cardinals, they're playing that game from the point they become cardinal to position themselves in alliance to take the papacy one day. It's got nothing to do with God. It's got nothing to do with being Jesus Christ's representative on earth. It has everything to do with power, with secular, narcissistic power. However, Borgia was slightly different because he was the most debaucherous out of all the popes. Out of everybody who had pulled the same stunts as Rodrigo, Rodrigo took it a step further. No one was safe with Rodrigo Borgia as the pope. No one was safe with his children running around Italy doing whatever the hell they wanted to do because daddy's the pope. And so this cardinal finally decided to use the actual seminary as a way to get the king of France to remove Rodrigo from the throne. But Rodrigo, remember how I said from a very young age, he's shown himself to be very cunning, very smart, and he was able to manipulate politics. Rodrigo doesn't fight back with warfare. Rodrigo fights back by going to King Charles VIII and offering him land in Italy. The principalities of Italy that everyone in Europe is fighting over. He goes, you know what? If you back me as Pope and you don't challenge my papacy, I'm going to give you some land. Some of this fresh, vibrant land. It's yours. So King Charles VIII goes, okay, cool. You're Pope. Then, Rodrigo, Pope Alexander VI, turns around and basically betrays the King of France. He does this by defeating France by taking an alliance with Spain and the German principalities. He quickly comes back and appoints 12 new cardinals because he knows this is going to cause a bit of a little bit of friction. So he secures 12 more cardinals as his security. His uncle pope in the past secured him and his brothers as cardinals to secure uncle pope. Now Rodrigo is doing the same thing. But his uncle Pope only secured two people. Rodrigo secures 12. In 1494, France fights back and comes in to sack Florence. After it sacks Florence, it then comes to seize Rome. 1495, Rodrigo's cunning diplomacy wins again. He's able to work out an agreement with the French king. I don't know why people back then make agreements because it's not like they ever last. But anyway... So he gets the friend, the French out of, of Rome. And the funny thing is with Florence is coming up in a, in a few generations, we're going to have Catherine de Medici of Florence, who then is married to the House of Valois in France, who then connects Florence and, and Fra Fra France again. So I guess this is, I guess Catherine de Medici's time, it's kind of history repeating itself. But nonetheless, it's this, these constantly moving pieces given the territories of Italy being so valuable to all of the monarchies of Europe. At this point, Rodrigo has basically gotten away with everything. And so he ups the ante. Even more scandalous things start to happen, including very interesting parties that he allegedly threw with his children, which we'll talk about when we talk about the children. And he really starts to use his family even more as pawns. And in, just like any good mafia story, something else happens. One, his second born son ends up swimming with the fish, as the mafia would say. His body 
comes up in the Tigris River. There's a long list of people. We'll talk more about that again when we break down, especially Cesare, because Cesare, his brother, is one of the suspects that's been accused of unaliving his brother Juan. But there is a long list of people who could have Juan's throat because the Borgias were literally hated by everyone. At 72 years old, on the 18th of August, 1503, Pope Alexander VI, Rodrigo Borgia, leaves the earth. He passes away. Now, how did he pass away, you might ask? Well, he got sick. We know he was sick. But to this day, historians don't know if it was malaria or if it was poisoning. My bet is on poisoning. All right, you guys. Next week, we're going to do ladies first. We're going to start looking at Lucrezia Borgia, the scandals. We'll talk more about the scandals with the individual children because are they spicy or what? This is this is some juicy gossip. All right, you guys. So join us again on Monday at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time over on Aquarius Rising Africa, where we will be discussing Rodrigo Borgia live with Shanti. You guys can join in the conversation. If you are new to my channel, Shanti over on Aquarius Rising Africa is very well versed in a lot of ritual stuff and occultism. And so it's really cool to talk about these stories with her because she's able to pick out certain things that maybe we would have missed otherwise. So I hope you guys are having a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day. I will talk to you soon. Please leave me your comments and your thoughts down in the comment section below. Before anybody asks, another little bit of information. A lot of people want to know if the Borgias still have descendants. Yes, there are a lot of Borgia descendants out there. They're over in Latin America, South America, and of course, over in Europe. Some of the, the descendants don't even know their descendants. They've only found that out through doing their ancestral DNA testing, but... Borgia had a lot of kids. Their kids had a lot of kids. It is what it is. So anyway, I will talk to you guys soon. Bye, everybody.